everybody? Hi, so we're going to get started today. Uh, today I'm going to speak a little bit about dreaming and some of its emotional processing functions. I'm really going to cover a couple of different theories of dreaming uh, and also uh, present to you some of the discussion or debate that uh, there's been in the scientific literature regarding the function of dreams. Um, but before we get there, I was wondering, we were having quite a sort of robust discussion at the end of the last session, whether there were any leftover questions from yesterday that um, people had to ask. And then uh, um, there's been a request from the audience to leave questions till the end. So um, we can do that today. Uh, I have um, made the session a little bit shorter, so we do have some extra time for questions. So we'll see. We might finish a few minutes early, um, or uh, you know, we'll use that time for questions. We see how we go. Any questions from yesterday still that anybody was pondering? Yes. Um, not necessarily more or less, but we know that sleep is important for creative functions. So for example, you're more likely to um, come up with a novel solution to a problem after a period of sleep than after a period of waking. Uh, and sort of like historically and uh, anecdotally, we know in the literature, just in the popular literature, that you, know, you might have that light bulb moment after a good night's sleep. Um, or you might suddenly put things together after a good night's sleep. And that has to do with the fact that, uh, like I described yesterday, that information that you've remembered from the previous day is then integrated into other networks of knowledge. So it's easier for you to make connections between things um, after a period of sleep. Uh-huh. So that's essentially a failure of that system. Um, and we do a little bit. We twitch. So REM is characterized by this uh, period that's predominated by muscle atonia, in other words, paralysis. But uh, the, these little bursts of activity that kind of make it through, and that's essentially, the, these are like phasic events. You'll see like on the electromyograph, which is the channel recording muscle activity, you'll see little bursts. And that's probably little bursts of activity coming through. They're not really supposed to, but it's not a perfect biological system. Um, so it does come through. That dog is particularly, um, <laughs> that dog was particularly uh, disinhibited in that way. Um, but we, there is also a disorder called REM behavior disorder, as I mentioned yesterday, which is characterized by this um, uh, sort of the failure of that system to inhibit muscle movement and individuals then acting out their dreams. And in fact, crimes have been committed in that way where um, individuals have strangled or hurt their partners um, because they're dre having a dream that they're fighting or... Um, you know, strangling their partner in a, f in a fight, and, and they're really doing that. Um, so individuals with that disorder have to take certain precautions. For example, sleep alone, sleep in a room. Um, <laughs> I mean, it sounds funny, but it's, re it's really quite serious. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, it's quite a tough one, sure. As you can imagine, imagine the, the defense building an argument. He was sleeping. Um, <laughs> and it's much more prevalent in men, actually, than in women. Yeah. Why is it called rapid eye movement if, if you're in that state of not moving? Because your eyes are moving. So everything down from the head is, is paralyzed. Uh, um, and certainly, um, you know, you have, like, little breakthrough moments, like I said, like for example, sleep talking is like a breakthrough moment, but the rapid eye movements are well documented. That's not necessarily disinhibited. And that's probably also because of the way that the brain is connected. The cranial nerves that control <coughs> eye movements are connected a, perhaps a little bit higher than the normal kind of um, muscle paralysis, which sort of connects a little bit lower and then, then sort of cascades down into the rest of the body. 
Uh, it's a hypothesis, but. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, s snoring is, is very common, um, and it has to do with the relaxation and kind of slight collapse of the um, uh, kind of folds of the throat. Uh, it's a problem uh, if it translates into sleep apnea which um, some of you may have heard of, uh, which is characterized essentially by these periods of no breathing, um, where the individual stops breathing. It's actually very scary for partners because it, it sounds like your partner has literally stopped breathing. And that period can last quite long, even you know, as long as 30 seconds or a minute or so. Um, and then the person literally starts gasping for breath and wakes up, and it's associated with very, very poor sleep quality, feeling very tired the next day, um, and uh, associated um, increase in, for example, uh, cardio metabolic risk factors. Yeah, so that's, uh, th and it is treatable as well. Yeah, but not everybody who snores has sleep apnea. Um, so, I don't actually know too much about leg cramping. I mean, I know I, I, it's quite common. Uh, my partner actually has quite bad leg cramps, but I'm not, I don't know about the physiology of that. Why one, you know, they say that cramping is associated with dehydration, but that's not always seems to be the case at night. So that's a good question. Yeah. So let's get going today, and then we'll, we'll have a whole session of questions um, at the end. Um, so what I'm going to first start with, just as a, as a broad overview of some of the main debates in um, thinking about dreaming and why we might dream. I'm going to show you a small uh, video after that, and then go into a bit more detail about some of the theories. So uh, one of the main and sort of first uh, psychological real like interrogations of dreaming came from Freud, uh, which will come as no surprise to a lot of you, um, where dreaming was considered sort of the unconscious wish fulfillment, uh, where something that not only were there elements sort of from conscious everyday life that were coming into dreams, but actually these were generated by processes that uh, individuals are not aware of in their conscious everyday life and symbolize some kind of drive or wish fulfillment or something that was unresolved. Um, and by being able to sort of study and think about these kinds of, uh, or the elements of dreams, uh, you were able to learn something about your own unconscious drives. Um, since then, there's been sort of a backlash against that, that, uh, you know, it's all about your unconscious and something, uh, uh, Freud had put things uh, in terms of aggression and sex, and to many people that seemed uh, like a step too far. So there was quite a backlash against that in, in the age of sort of modern psychology uh, and also the discovery of some of the brain mechanisms associated with dreaming and REM sleep. Uh, there were alternative theories that were proposed. Uh, and sort of the main uh, dominant set of theories, uh, and the little video that I'll show you uh, shows a number of them, they're kind of, they're mixed up, but we can talk about them afterwards, is that really dreaming is an epiphenomena of the brain processes that happen during REM sleep. That REM sleep has, follows a certain biological trajectory, and dreaming is just actually an accident. It's the w way that the brain puts together a series of images and things that come up during the process of REM sleep, we stitch it together uh, and feel like it is a dream or a meaningful thing, but actually that's something that we are creating. So it's not in and of itself something that's meaningful, but rather a byproduct of a biological process. 
Um, and this came about sort of in the context where we started to understand uh, human cognition as a, in the sort of way of a kind of a computer analogy that we are, uh, we can understand how we work, there's br processes that happen, it's quite systematic, uh, sort of following the Skinner model where we study behavior, there's nothing inherent or sort of, uh, they're not invisible mental processes that we, we can't somehow see or understand. Um, and, and sort of in that philosophical, from that philosophical background came this idea um, that dreams are actually just a kind of epiphenomenon. But there's been other theories since then which have proposed that we can understand dreams as meaningful or that they have a meaningful role uh, in the sleep process. Uh, and that's because humans aren't only like computers and our brains aren't only like computers where we can sort of, you know, lay out logically uh, this process leads to that process which then allows us to integrate a visual image in this way, um, a sort of very cognitive approach. But we're also emotional feeling creatures where things mean, it feels something to be a human, it feels something to be an individual. And from that perspective, that sort of philosophical perspective, um, we can also neuroscientifically um, study the phenomenon of dreaming. Uh, so that's kind of like the background. And really this has become quite a prominent debate or it was a, um, there was a time where, uh, a few years ago, where it was really, really uh, hot debate around whether dreaming is simply an epiphenomena or something meaningful. And I think we have some clarity on it now, but still many questions left. So let me show you. This is just a little video to overview some of the theories. Um, it's from uh, the sort of TED series, and it's, it takes a little bit of sort of scientific liberty. Some of the theories of dreaming are actually theories of sleep. Um, but I'll go over some of the ones that are quite useful afterwards. In the third millennium BCE, Mesopotamian kings recorded and interpreted their dreams on wax tablets. A thousand years later, ancient Egyptians wrote a dream book listing over a hundred common dreams and their meanings. And in the years since, we haven't paused in our quest to understand why we dream. So, after a great deal of scientific research, technological advancement, and persistence, we still don't have any definite answers, but we have some interesting theories. We dream to fulfill our wishes. In the early 1900s, Sigmund Freud proposed that while all of our dreams, including our nightmares, are a collection of images from our daily conscious lives, they also have symbolic meanings, which relate to the fulfillment of our subconscious wishes. Freud theorized that everything we remember when we wake up from a dream is a symbolic representation of our unconscious primitive thoughts, urges, and desires. Freud believed that by analyzing those remembered elements, the unconscious content would be revealed to our conscious mind, and psychological issues stemming from its repression could be addressed and resolved. We dream to remember. To increase performance on certain mental tasks, sleep is good, but dreaming while sleeping is better. In 2010, researchers found that subjects were much better at getting through a complex 3D maze if they had napped and dreamed of the maze prior to their second attempt. In fact, they were up to 10 times better at it than those who only thought of the maze while awake between attempts, and those who napped but did not dream about the maze. Researchers theorize that certain memory processes can happen only when we are asleep, and our dreams are a signal that these processes are taking place. We dream to forget. There are about 10,000 trillion neural connections within the architecture of your brain. They are created by everything you think and everything you do. A 1983 neurobiological theory of dreaming called reverse learning holds that while sleeping, and mainly during REM sleep cycles, your neocortex reviews these neural connections and dumps the unnecessary ones. Without this unlearning process, which results in your dreams, your brain could be overrun by useless connections, and parasitic thoughts could disrupt the necessary thinking you need to do while you're awake. We dream to keep our brains working. 
The continual activation theory proposes that your dreams result from your brain's need to constantly consolidate and create long-term memories in order to function properly. So when external input falls below a certain level, like when you're asleep, your brain automatically triggers the generation of data from its memory storages, which appear to you in the form of the thoughts and feelings you experience in your dreams. In other words, your dreams might be a random screensaver your brain turns on so it doesn't completely shut down. We dream to rehearse. Dreams involving dangerous and threatening situations are very common, and the primitive instinct rehearsal theory holds that the content of a dream is significant to its purpose. Whether it's an anxiety-filled night of being chased through the woods by a bear or fighting off a ninja in a dark alley, these dreams allow you to practice your fight or flight instincts and keep them sharp and dependable in case you'll need them in real life. But it doesn't always have to be unpleasant. For instance, dreams about your attractive neighbor could actually give your reproductive instinct some practice too. We dream to heal. Stress neurotransmitters in the brain are much less active during the REM stage of sleep, even during dreams of traumatic experiences leading some researchers to theorize that one purpose of dreaming is to take the edge off painful experiences to allow for psychological healing. Reviewing traumatic events in your dreams with less mental stress may grant you a clearer perspective and an enhanced ability to process them in psychologically healthy ways. People with certain mood disorders and PTSD often have difficulty sleeping, leading some scientists to believe that lack of dreaming may be a contributing factor to their illnesses. We dream to solve problems. Unconstrained by reality and the rules of conventional logic, in your dreams, your mind can create limitless scenarios to help you grasp problems and formulate solutions that you may not consider while awake. John Steinbeck called it the committee of sleep, and research has demonstrated the effectiveness of dreaming on problem solving. It's also how renowned chemist August Kekula discovered the structure of the benzene molecule. And it's the reason that sometimes the best solution for a problem is to sleep on it. And those are just a few of the more prominent theories. As technology increases our capability for understanding the brain, it's possible that one day we will discover the definitive reason for them. But until that time arrives, we'll just have to keep on dreaming. Great. So some of those theories, for example, the dream to forget is more actually, a, uh, we know now, uh, relevant to deep sleep, sort of that uh, phase in the first half of the night, rather than to dreaming or REM sleep. So as I mentioned, there, there's sort of some scientific inaccuracies there. But certainly a lot of those theories can be thought of as falling into either uh, the camp that's associated with dreaming as an epiphenomenon or dreaming as something meaningful. For example, dreaming as a screensaver, you know, just to keep our brains active, um, falls into this uh, idea that uh, dreaming is only just an accident from the brain processes that occur during REM sleep. So I'm going to describe in a little bit more detail where that theory came from, essentially. Um, and it came from a researcher called Hobson and his team. And Hobson has, uh, he's trained very many prominent researchers which have now advanced, for example, all that research that I told you about sleep and memory yesterday. Um, his uh, team from Berkeley, um, Walker is another very famous um, Research. In fact, Matthew Walker has a very good book out, if you want to have a look, a recent book uh, on sleep, um, which I highly recommend. Hobson's, uh, sort of one of the main discoveries, or the theory that he proposed, was called the activation synthesis model. And it came from the discovery that REM sleep is activated by certain nuclei in the midbrain, in a, a structure called the pons, um, which is in blue in, that, in the picture that you see on the screen. Uh, so quite low down in the brain. And there's a set of nuclei in the reticular activating system, which essentially turns REM sleep on. 
And because sort of 80 to 90% of dreams are uh, kind of found or recorded from REM sleep, if you wake somebody up in REM sleep, they're likely to give you a dream report. <coughs> there was a conflation between REM sleep and dreaming. Uh, individuals thought that um, uh, REM sleep was simply the biological expression of dreaming. And so uh, from this point of view, if you then removed these uh, specific nuclei, you would then remove uh, REM sleep. And there's a series sort of, if we, if we look at the pons, the pons in the reticular activating system, the nuclei then, uh, there's firing that connects to the lateral geniculate nucleus and then to areas that are associated with visual production, which makes sense because we know that dreams are very visual. You, we dream about things that we can see, essentially. Uh, and so that, that made a lot of sense. Uh, and what researchers also discovered was that when you obliterated those genes and um, those nuclei in the reticular activating system, REM sleep ceased to be. They did a lot of experiments in cats, for which I feel very sorry for. Um, but these cats had these uh, sort of nuclei uh, removed, and they then no longer had REM sleep. Um, and so the series of images then that arose uh, from the activation of these visual areas in the brain were then assumed to be sort of stitched together by sort of frontal areas into a meaningful story. A and that story is what we then called the dream. And it was simply a byproduct of this firing process uh, originating in the ponds and moving up into the rest of the brain. Um, and so from that point of view, dreaming was simply uh, an epiphenomenon of uh, this REM process that occurred. And then you may have heard in our psychology department, there's a, quite a well-known dream and sleep researcher called Mark Soames. Has anyone ever been to a talk by Mark? He's, he's, um, he does a lot of uh, sort of talking about sleep and dreaming. Um, and he discovered that actually the process of REM sleep and dreaming is not equivalent or it's not the same. Um, in fact, we can show that they are doubly dissociable. In other words, there's different brain regions that are responsible for REM sleep and for dreaming. He did a, a series of studies. So these, a lot of these studies were done in, the studies by Hobson were done in animals. And animals, of course, uh, because we thought that REM sleep and dreaming was the same thing, we, we weren't too worried about asking the animals about their dreams. You know, obviously, uh, we can't ask a cat or a rat whether they are dreaming. We're just assuming they're dreaming, you know, from the behavior, for example, that we can see, um, and uh, uh, because there was that conflation. But uh, Mark did a series of studies in human patients looking at individuals that had both, uh, for example, stro had had strokes in their pons area, so in other words, were unable to generate REM sleep, and he found that those individuals were in fact still reporting dreams. And he did a series of studies in uh, individuals that had had strokes in other parts of the brain, specifically the basal forebrain, uh, which is located in the lower frontal region. Um, deep white matter, so you have gray matter on the outside of the brain and white matter on the inside. Deep in the frontal lobe, white matter bundles that had been destroyed resulted in a cessation of dreaming. So those individuals were no longer able to dream. So this meant that REM sleep was not equivalent to dreaming because you could still have, uh, if you had no REM sleep, you could have dreaming. And if you had destruction in other parts of the brain, dreaming could end while you still had REM sleep. So from, there, uh, from that time forward, we realized that there's actually quite a complex 
uh, set of brain regions that are responsible for generating brain, uh, for generating dreaming. We certainly know that REM sleep seems to provide a good neurobiological sort of grounding to allow for dreaming to occur, because uh, certain, certainly we have the visual areas that are activated, but we also have a lot of limbic areas, so the amygdala, the hippocampus, that are activated, and that seems to be related to this sort of very rich emotional tex texture associated with dreaming. What we do know that is also uh, sort of switched off are these higher order areas in the frontal lobe. So, thing, so areas that are responsible for reality testing, for making sure that something is really real, those areas are turned off, which makes sense because you, know, you can do bizarre things in your dreams. Um, and another very important finding uh, that Mark discovered was that the areas that seem to be responsible for dreaming, in other words, when those areas were removed, dreaming no longer happened, were really associated with motivation. So there seems to be something inherent uh, to do with dreaming and motivation. So what some of the theories have proposed uh, since then is that dreaming is actually the active ingredient. So sort of like REM sleep or deep sleep or you know these different brain uh, stages sort of provide an environment for which these mental processes can occur, which do a certain kind of sort of mental work, as it were. Um, and the dreaming is, in fact, the active ingredient in uh, sort of some of these processes. So some, as sort of the video proposed, is that dreaming is an active ingredient in uh, memory consolidation. Um, but we also know from more recent research that it seems that deep sleep has a very, or slow wave sleep, has a much more sort of prominent role in actual memory consolidation processes, in sort of moving information and downscaling connections. Uh, dreaming does have a role, but perhaps not as prominent as deep sleep. But we certainly know that dreaming is very important for emotional processes. Um, but even here, there are different theories. So uh, one of the theories, which they called the primitive instinct um, rehearsal theory in the video, uh, is actually called the threat simulation theory. I'm going to describe in a little bit more detail. But there's a theory proposed by uh, Mark and also several other researchers which suggests that dreaming is actually really important for solving emotional problems. Um, so uh, the threat simulation theory um, is a sort of an evolutionary theory. It says that dreaming is therefore purpose. It's not just an epiphenomenon, as we described. But it's there so that we can practice really sort of difficult or threatening situations so that we can have some mastery over them while we awake, essentially. Uh, and this stems from the fact that it, it appears that a lot of dreams, uh, you know, we say in your dreams or sleep like a baby, but often it's actually quite the opposite. The reality is quite the opposite. Um, you know, dreams are often filled by quite negative content. Things go horribly wrong. Um, my husband for years used to dream about failing maths tests um, in a recurrent kind of way. I mean, he hasn't been at school for however many years, um, but never mind. Uh, so there seems to be this real kind of negative valence to dreams. Um, the content uh, seems, you seem to grapple with something. Um, and this theory proposes that dreams are really sort of like a safe place where you can practice uh, these kinds of things that go wrong or can go wrong in your everyday life. You know, in the, back in the day when we uh, still had to fend off other animals, you might dream about how you would deal with dangerous animals, uh, and that would really, you know, these are situations that were really threatening to your survival. Um, these days they might be more socially related, but in any case, that. Uh, 
there are concerns that really sort of threaten our personal integrity, as it were. Uh, and some of the evidence that was proposed for this theory was from dream studies sort of across uh, different cultures, which showed that uh, children, for example, who were uh, in um, sort of living in peaceful situations or living in war-torn situations, such as, for example, in Palestine, had uh, dreams that were characterized by more aggression, by more violence, by um, uh, sort of a greater degree of threat. So this was taken as evidence that uh, when you have more threat, you dream about more threatening situations, and that's so that you can practice how to deal with it. Um, do you guys think it's a good theory? Huh? Okay, so it's, it, that sounds like a, like a yes. Um, um, but there has been some counter evidence, uh, and some of the counter evidence has been uh, along the lines that even in those kids sort of in Palestine uh, who were having these dreams, if, this, if dreaming provides a sort of safe container for you to practice um, uh, things that are negative or difficult or troubling um, or threatening, you should have some kind of better mastery over your life. But in fact, a lot of the time, these individuals who had these more troubling dreams were struggling more in fact, had greater degrees of depression, PTSD. Um, and so it doesn't explain, for example, why individuals who have these horrible, horrible nightmares in PTSD um, are sort of practicing to master something, but it doesn't seem to be very adaptive. In fact, they are struggling both um, in terms of their emotional functioning and things like concentration, daily ability. Um, and so if uh, this theory says that you're gaining mastery over something, something seems to be out of place here. Um, um, Mark then went on to do a follow-up study looking at um, the difference between dreaming in South Africa and in Wales. Uh, Wales is sort of characterized by very low levels of crime. Uh, South African sort of township areas are, are characterized by high levels of crime. So we expect South Africans to have much more, or to have dreams that are characterized by threatening content to a greater degree than individuals living in Wales. And in fact, that was not the case. The opposite was the case. Uh, so again, um, we're not entirely sure that this theory um, lives up to the scientific evidence. But um, it certainly may be the case that dreaming uh, is useful for solving emotional problems. Uh, and in fact, there was a very famous series of studies by Cartwright and, and colleagues uh, who evaluated the dreams of women who were going through a divorce. Um, so starting at the time of the divorce and then following up for a year or so and looking at the profile of dreams. And what Cartwright discovered was that women who actually actively grappled with the dream, with um, elements of the divorce over a, you know, a period of time were less depressed at the end of uh, the year or however long the follow-up was than women who did not dream uh, of the actual conflict or the, the marital problems that were happening. So it seems that there's some evidence at least that dreaming is there perhaps not to practice threatening situations but to solve some kind of emotional problems. Um, and it might be that REM sleep provides the right kind of biological environment for that kind of dreaming to occur. Um, so one, one sort of suggestion is that REM sleep as a whole uh, performs the function of kind of going through the daily 
events or, or things that happen. And there is some evidence for that. We know that there's a replay of events from waking um, in sleep and that it's actually very, very sort of sequential. We know that from rat studies where they have, for example, looked at the pattern of firing of neurons through an experience and seen the exact replication and firing pattern, same neurons, same time sequence during um, REM sleep. Uh, so we know that there's sort of a, a replication um, of firing there. So in other words, we can think of it sort of as a filing system. You're going along um, sort of making sense of these uh, events that have happened and you stumble as you're going through these sort of events, you stumble upon something that is unresolved or some kind of an emotional problem. And, and that starts essentially the process uh, of dreaming. Dreaming does the work then of trying to uh, sort of essentially solve the emotional problem as it were. Um, so if it's successful, so it may or may not be successful, it may take more than one go, for example. Uh, it might not just be resolved in a single night. Of course, we know that some of the, the struggles that we have are quite uh, endure over many months or, or even years. And so emotional work may not happen simply in a single night. But if it is successful, then your mood and your feeling the next day is better. Um, and if it doesn't, then there's still something to work on. So, in other words, you may have that uh, dream again. So, sort of the idea behind recurrent dreams, and it's not often specifically the thing that happens. It might not be the maths test, essentially, that's the problem, but it's something around, um, you know, wanting to perform well or do well. Um, for example, that someone is still working through. What does that mean for me? And that, that's still something that's relevant. And so it comes up again as you're going through the day's sort of uh, uh, filing away the day's events, comes up and you have a dream about it. And that's to perform the emotional work, essentially, of uh, making sense of that issue. So this is another theory. It's something uh, that we are testing in our laboratory at the moment. Of course, these things are quite difficult to test because dreaming is so subjective. Uh, but I am supervising a student who's essentially looking at the first half of the dream and the second half of the dream, the first half of the night and the second half of the night, and seeing if uh, both mood and content changes over those time periods. So we expect and this has actually been this has been shown before, but hopefully we will replicate it. That at the beginning of the night, dreams are perhaps a little bit more fraught. Towards the end of the night, there is a little bit more resolution in dreams, um, and that in the first half there'll be more sort of grappling, and then the second half there may be a bit more resolution in the dream content. Um, and very importantly, we're getting participants to self-rate their dreams. So a lot of the, uh, there seems to be a major discrepancy between when individuals rate their own dreams and when external raters rate their own dreams. And that's because sometimes the content in dreams doesn't match up to the feeling. Something might happen, and maybe it's even terrible, but you don't feel, somehow you have quite a positive feeling about it. And so it's very important for individuals to rate their own dreams. Um, so we are busy with that study at the moment. Um, then the, that sort of brings me to the end of some of my thinking around uh, why we may dream. But there are still some other outstanding, interesting questions. Um, so I'll maybe talk through some of these, and then we can bleed that in to the uh, question session. While I'm sort of thinking about some of these questions, I do open it up um, for uh, question session and we can follow up with questions from the actual slide deck now. So um, some sort of popular things that often come up is why do we not remember our dreams? Uh, typically, I mean, some individuals remember their dreams really well and some don't, but it has to do with the fact that 
during REM sleep, the sort of dialogue or the pattern of firing between areas that are responsible for memory, such as the hippocampus, and frontal areas where a lot of the memories are stored, is not direct. Information only flows one way. So information flows from other parts of the brain into the hippocampus, but not out again. And the hippocampus is a very important job of indexing or saying this belongs with that, that doesn't belong with that. And so you have this, you have no sort of um, grounding um, in sort of firm memory structures. And so when you remember, when you wake up, you don't have that instant feeling of uh, remembering. It's sort of like a fleeting thing which disappears because that memory flow is not um, as it is during waking. So that's one of the reasons why we don't remember their dream, our dreams. But some people are really good at remembering their dreams. And that's probably because um, individuals who remember their dreams are slightly lighter sleepers um, and tend to have more arousals in REM sleep. So if you're actually waking up in REM sleep, you're more likely to catch that dream. Um, individuals who have less of an arousal threshold tend to sleep through, don't necessarily wake up in REM sleep. It has to be a really prominent dream for you to actually hold on to it. Um, and uh, why are REM dreams um, bizarre? Well, that also has to do with uh, the fact that we have these emotional centers that are so active, but also because uh, of that flow of information that I just described. So uh, information's coming sort of from the outside um, into hippocampal, into memory structures, but not the other way around. There isn't this indexing, uh, and so uh, things that are quite unrelated may um, happen at the same time, of course driven by the, the emotional centers, um, uh, as we spoke about earlier. And then I'm sure many of you would have heard about and maybe interested in lucid dreaming. Um, so lucid dreaming is when you dream and you uh, can go into your dream and direct what happens. You can train to yourself to be able to do that. There's quite a um, sort of a good literature on how to do that. Uh, and we now know that uh, it is something that we can actually demonstrate uh, neuroscientifically as a kind of dreaming process that is a little bit different from normal dreaming. All those centers of the brain that are usually turned off, the reality testing, the sort of self-awareness, those in fact are turned on um, during lucid dreaming. So that makes sense because there is some kind of active component of control. Uh, so it's really, it is a, like neuroscientifically we can say, as it were, that it does exist. Um, and it can be useful for trying to sort of gain some mastery over difficult uh, emotional or other problems as well. All right, so I'm going to open to the floor and, and please feel free to ask any questions you may have. Um, well, in, not really, because daydreaming is the sort of loose, in some ways there is a loose association of thoughts, but the idea with lucid dreaming is that you go into the story and you take control or you direct some kind of element, where daydreaming is a much more sort of free-flowing process that doesn't necessarily have this ele directive element. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, no, that's not lucid dreaming, but it is, it's very, very common. Um, because uh, sort of the REM sleep stage and the dreaming stage is very persistent. We see that in the sleep lab. Often we'll see, we'll wake somebody up for a dream report. They go straight back into REM sleep afterwards. It's more like the persistence of that stage. And it probably has something to do with the fact that we really need it. Um, so it, it sort of persists, despite the fact that it may be interrupted. Well, in REM sleep. Yeah. So how can that guy who's dreaming strangle his wife? So
So he's got a failure of that mechanism which does the paralysis. It's supposed to work, but um, in some individuals it doesn't, and so, so then people act out their dreams. There's the sort of the reverse problem, and ma many of you may have experienced this, it's quite common actually, where you wake up and you feel like you can't move. Um, and a lot of people have ascribed that to ghosts or spiritual experiences, um, but we know that essentially it's the paralysis which hasn't eased up yet. You have regained consciousness, but you are still essentially paralyzed. And the way you, some people need to go back into sleep to wake up again in a different stage, um, other individuals are just sort of, it fades over a minute or so. But it can be quite frightening because you wake up feeling paralyzed. Um, Um, yes, you can. You can. Um, because you can, for example, take a video of somebody, you can see, um, you can put electrodes on their head and their face, see that they're in REM sleep, but see that their muscle activity hasn't decreased as it normally would. And that's basically a diagnosis of REM behavior disorder. So you can, I mean, that's, I suppose that's useful to say that this actually is, you know, you can easily get away with murder by saying, sorry, I was sleeping. <laughs> At the back. So the question is, um, when you, in lucid dreaming, uh, the reality centers are switched on, uh, and how does that change from sort of normal dreaming? Am I understanding correctly? Um, we're not really sure exactly. It's some kind of a, a sort of trained ability that you acquire, but exactly sort of how we are able to develop that ability, we don't know the answer to that question. We've just been able to show that uh, I guess it's quite exciting when it feels like it is something, but then you can actually demonstrate it, um, you know, by seeing it on a brain scan, for example. Um, if you're dreaming and you're, you're falling or in an elevator that's going up and doesn't stop the Yeah, there is an element of uh, such a s sort of arousal, and that's often what happens in individuals who have like a lot of nightmares, is that there's just too much arousal and you wake up, and so that's actually disruptive of sleep. Um, and in this emotional theory, it's the fact that you're trying to solve something, but it hasn't, it hasn't quite succeeded yet. You need to work on it a bit more, essentially. So, I mean, obviously, that's a signal from the body. It's one way that the body is trying to fix the problem. Um, but, of course, there are other ways, you know, um, psychological therapies and um, pharmacological interventions that can help individuals who have who are really struggling with symptoms. Practical question. Uh, absolutely. So, How do you find it? Do you stay there during the night? Or? Yeah, so sleep research is brutal. I did quite a lot of it, unfortunately, in my time. Um, but uh, essentially, you spend the whole night watching somebody sleep. When they go into REM sleep, you wake them up because you're 80 to 90% likely to get a dream report um, when they are in REM sleep, even if they're very low dream reporters, it's, you, you, there's less um, of a chance of getting a dream report, but still a very high percentage when they're in REM sleep, and particular, particularly in those REM stages towards the end of the night when the REM periods get quite long. Um, so th from there you can get a report, and obviously you can get then look at the mood, the content, um, all kinds of aspects to do with the dream and relate that to their overall sleep quality, to their emotional functioning, to their memory, um, that kind of thing. You can also, some people have done sleep research um, by getting individuals to sleep in an MRI scanner, 
and which I think is a miracle, but so, for some people apparently it puts them to sleep. Uh, they're very noisy, for those of you who have never um, been near an MRI scanner, but they are incredibly noisy. Um, but some, it's a kind of repetitive sort of, I wouldn't call it white noise because it's very loud, um, but it's a repetitive kind of noise. So for some people it really puts them to sleep. Um, and those are the people you want in your experiment, by the way. Um, so, <laughs> um, and then the, you have the individual connected to the EEG, so you know what stage of sleep they're in, because without that you're also a bit lost. And then you can look at what you know, brain activations are occurring. Um, but there's actually very few studies, there are studies that are done like that, but it's very ambitious and you get a lot of, it's very expensive to do the scans, but there's a lot of data that you have to discard because somebody didn't fall asleep or moved or, um, you know, any one of those problems. But the fact that they know that being tested doesn't make an um, it always does. So dream reports in laboratories are often a bit different to dream reports at home. So people will often dream about being in the laboratory or something like that. Um, but uh, so it's never perfect, and science isn't perfect. But there is, we can still learn things, and we can still um, by testing a lot of people, you get rid of some of that error variance, you can look at some other aspects as well. Yeah. Um, it's, I mean, it's generated by your visual centers. I mean, it just it shows how amazing the human mind uh, and the human brain is. I mean, we have like a memory bank of thousands and thousands of faces, and we're able to combine those elements into unique kind of characters. So it's possible. There was a question somewhere in front here as well. I'd say if it was once a year, take those sleeping tablets. <laughs> um, at most people, unless you have a some kind of a visual uh, sort of change or something like that, most people dream in color. But there is, there are some reports and it's to do when things aren't quite working that you dream in, in black and white. We know that um, animal or like dogs dream more in black and white, but that's because of the way that they they see mostly in black and white. I think they have a little bit of green or something like that in their visual spectrum. Mm Um, th that's a very good question around whether blind people still have visual dreams. Um, I, I can't quite remember the literature, but it is absolutely possible for you to have um, still visual uh, kind of representation in the mind in the absence of being able to see because those brain areas, there's like the primary visual cortex. So it depends also on the reason for your blindness. So for example, the studies that Mark did um, showed that individuals who are cortically blind, so in other words, blind because of the centers in their brain